two people are having a conversation and they're reducing their points they're maybe keeping it to straight binary we see a lot of political polarization that's occurring today in united states politics finding a lot of the beauty and the nuance of conversation when you take complex position and you maybe stay equanimous rather than become agitated um, all of these things tend to drive better conversations and it seems as though you're leading that forefront what 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 do you see in that sort of path that we're walking of figuring out how to have better conversations there's a I, I write about this a fair bit in 12 Rules for Life. There's a chapter, I think it's chapter 9, I think that's right. Uh, assume that the person that you're listening to knows something you don't. It's kind of a derivation of some, of some things that I learned from Carl Rogers, who was a great clinician, great 20th century clinician. He, his star sort of rose during the 1960s. He was a humanist. Um, he was a Christian missionary when he was a kid, but he dropped that. and. He, he became a le leading light in humanistic psychology, and he was really interested in the preconditions for therapeutic conversation. Um, and he thought that, well, if, if you were going to engage in the process of therapy with a client, that the client had to bring to the session before he or she arrived the willingness to make things better. That would be the first thing. Yeah. Right? So that, and I, I've done therapy that was court mandated it's like i wouldn't recommend that that just doesn't work very well you know because you can't force someone to be better they, they have to kind of come already thinking that there's a bunch of things they don't know and that their life could be better than it already is and that's a good position to take when you're engaging in a conversation with someone it's like look if you already know enough more power to you man you know but if you're suffering more than you think is necessary, which is like highly probable, or, or more than you think is desirable, which basically means if you're suffering more than you think is desirable, that means that you're way more ignorant than you need to be. Right? That's what it means. Because maybe you have an illness, you don't know how to cure it. Yeah. Maybe you're having a fight with someone, you don't know how to get out of it. Maybe you're failing at work and you don't know what to do about it. It's like you're ignorant. And, yeah. and no wonder, because yeah. people are ignorant. And, so you might think, well, unless everything is just the way you want it to be, then you have something to learn. And then you think, well, maybe the person you're talking to, no matter how uncomfortable you are with their opinions and how bent out of shape you think they are, maybe even how bent out of shape they actually are, there's always the possibility that if you actually engaged in a conversation, you asked them questions and you tried to figure out what they thought, that you'd come away with one crumb of knowledge more than you had when you went into the conversation. And like conversations like that are a lot more interesting. I found in my, you know, I've probably done 20,000 hours of clinical work, something like that. And so that's 20,000 hours of really, 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 really serious conversations. And they're almost always interesting beyond belief. And like I've had clients that, I, I told you already, that sort of spanned the entire spectrum from people who were so impaired cognitively and behaviorally that, well, they were utterly unemployable by any, any reasonable standards to people who were unbelievably high functioning and I found working with all of them if I if I'm in the zone properly it's ridiculously fascinating yeah because people are ridiculously interesting and yes. so and and everyone has their own characteristic experience that's actually unique and so if you have a real conversation yeah. with someone and they tell you what's unique about their experience the probability that you can learn something from that is it's it's well, it's, it's certain that you can. My, yeah. my low IQ clients, God, they taught me so much. It's just, for, they taught me how difficult things were first, you know, because to see someone struggle with a task that the typical person can do without even thinking sheds light on exactly how amazing it is that, that normal people can do that and how hard it is when, when you're impaired to the point where those sorts of normal behaviors become, become impossible. It's so enlightening, it teaches you a lot about the world. And so, I think part of the reason that YouTube is killing television is partly because it's technologically advantageous. I mean, make no mistake about it, there's nothing that TV yeah. can do that YouTube can't do. And there's a whole bunch of things that YouTube can do that TV can't. So it's obvious which one's going to win. But what's also interesting about it is that there seems to be a massive 
and relatively untapped market for actual conversation. And it's because conversation is between people of goodwill who are trying to tell the truth, who are trying to aim at making things better, is unbelievably valuable. I mean, at least in principle, that's what we're all doing here, right? I mean, yep. even though, you know, you guys aren't talking, um, that doesn't mean this isn't a conversation. You know, it's first of all, we're trying to pay attention to you at least enough to see if everyone is engaged in the conversation. If, if you're not engaged in it, then it would be completely pointless, yeah. right? And you one involved of the thing, them in your experiment. That was amazing. Well, one of the things I learned in my clinical practice is that if the conversation wasn't interesting, then I was doing it wrong. Yeah.